Isaiah chapter 9 talks about the Prince of Peace. You know what? We don't have to look very far in the news today to see that uh, we are not living in a time of peace. But one day, <laughs> one day we will. One day we will. We want to look in uh, the book of Mark chapter 1 this morning. Uh, if it was your job to introduce Jesus to the world, uh, where do you even begin with such an announcement? You have one chance only to tell people about him. Well, what would you say? What would you include? And what would you leave out? Uh, in John chapter 21, <laughs> I love how John writes this. Uh, John 21, 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Uh, what's John saying? Jesus did a lot of stuff. And throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have snapshots, don't we, of the life of Christ. 33 years, okay? 33 years that involved everything from being born from doing chores, from playing with his friends, I'm sure. How about this? Going to the temple. Getting lost in a crowd, because he did that too. Ultimately, dying on a cross for you and for me, there is so much that could be written. There aren't enough books that could contain it. We've been looking at the birth narratives a little bit over the last several weeks. We started uh, with the prophecy of the king uh, going all the way back 700 years, the book of Isaiah, and the prophecies that were included there. Last week, we talked about the genealogies. And I don't know about y'all, but uh, if you do the read through your Bible programs and you get to the book of Numbers, isn't that just fun? Don't you just, do you ever tell yourself, I'm going to work on every name until I can pronounce them correctly? Have you ever done that? Yeah, me neither. Because there are a lot of names there. And they're not names like your name and my name. I mean, some of them have three and four hyphens. That's a long name. But the genealogies are important. They're important in the book of Numbers. They're important here in the book of Matthew because it shows us the line that Jesus came from. It was to prove that Jesus was of the lineage of the king, David, and he was qualified to be the Messiah. I love Mark chapter 1. Uh, Mark chapter 1 just puts it very plain and puts it out there. I don't know about you all. I need simple. And I love simple. Mark chapter 1 verse 1. The, and the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Period. It doesn't get much more plain than that. You'll remember that uh, Matthew starts a genealogy. He takes 16 verses uh, to show that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Uh, in the book of John chapter 1, it starts out uh, where it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So uh, John uses 17 uh, words to show that Jesus is the Son of God. Luke begins with 82 verses that gives us a very detailed description of the birth of Christ. We're going to be there next week. It tells us that Jesus would come as the Savior of all men. And Mark puts it all together. Here in 12 words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, what he is saying here 
is that what he has to share is going to be very foundational to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll remember that the gospel is good news, right? That is what a gospel means. That is the message. The message is this. Salvation, repentance, both of them are necessary. Forgiveness is available. And it all happens because Christ came as a baby. It all happens because of what we celebrate in this time of year. And so Mark is going to make the case of the credentials of the king. You know, if, if there's going to be a king, you want to make sure that they're, they're able to do and they're qualified to do what they're going to do, right? Uh, just like you and I, uh, Margie used to do payroll. You don't want me doing payroll. I'm not, qual I'm not qualified to do payroll. I mess up a calculator, Elena. I would not be good at that. But for somebody like Margie, who can use a calculator with her eyes closed, does she have more credentials than I do? Oh, you better believe she does. Okay? Uh, likewise, uh, we had people out at the camp. Um, we, had, we had a situation with some trees, and Judy and I, we got to be out there watching them. And that was pretty cool. So they're, they're doing their stuff. Uh, do you think that Judy and I put on our harnesses? <laughs> and do you think that Judy actually shimmied up this tree with a chainsaw in each hand? Marilyn's going, yeah, I totally see that. No, she didn't do that. How come? We don't have the credentials to do what they could do. We didn't have the tools to do what they could do. Credentials are important. And Mark, here in, in just a very few verses, is really giving us the credentials of the king. He is going to use three character witnesses, John the Baptist, God the Father, and watch this, he even uses Satan, the tempter, to bring this all around and to show us that Christ is who he said he is. We see, first of all, that he was announced by man. You see, John's message had authority. It says this in verses 2 and 3, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist is saying that he is the messenger from God. And the message is based not on what he thinks, not on what is the opinion of the day, but his message is based solely on the authority of the word of God. In fact, his coming is foretold, as it is written in the prophets. You see, John the Baptist was a fulfillment of that which was foretold. One who would prepare the way for the Messiah. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 says this, Behold, I send my messenger. And he will do what? He will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. At this time, at 300 years of silence, God had not spoken. But just because God had not spoken does not mean God was not present. Because God was there. And here we go 300 years into the future. Here is it, John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah. You see, God's word is the authority for John's ministry. John didn't just take, wake up one day and say, Ta-da, here I am. Oh, by the way, I've got something for you. This was all done under the authority of Scripture. Under the authority of the very word of God. One of the things I like about John, John uh, gave the message 
under the authority of Scripture, and can I say this? Uh, John proclaimed it very boldly, didn't he? Uh, he did not sugarcoat things. He told it like it was. He dealt with issues of the day. He dealt with things that other people were afraid to tackle. He didn't dance around the truth. He didn't give his opinion. He revealed what God demanded of them and what God wanted them to know. Verse 4 gives us the aim of John's message. Jesus appeared or I'm sorry, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And so when we look at baptism, this is something that we practice here in this church. Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches practice this. But do you understand that in John's day, this was something that was very foreign uh, to the people? The Jews were being asked to do something that they had never done before. This was not a normal practice for them. The only thing that came close was the fact that Gentile converts to Judaism were baptized, but Jews were not baptized. They hadn't done this before. So John, as a Jew, asking the Jews to submit to something that they thought was only required of the Gentiles. We don't need this, but they do. And so John is putting it out there that this is for everyone. This baptism was a symbolic uh, of, of the washing away of the defilement of sin. Remember, Jews didn't look at themselves necessarily as sinners. But yet, John called all people to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. John 3.16, one of the best Christmas verses ever. For God so loved the world. Notice it doesn't say, for God so loved the Jews and everybody else, you're on your own. It doesn't say that. And so uh, John is, uh, as, as uh, uh, John the Baptist, as he is giving this message, he is pointing out that it is for everyone. The message is all about repentance. It's all about turning around. Making a change, a change in attitude that produces a change in practice. It's to have a change of mind about God, about sin, about one's self. To have a change of direction, to go a different way. I can guarantee you that if I get in my car, I can type in an address. I did this the other day. I typed in an address so that I could go and visit with somebody. And uh, I put that phone right up on my dashboard. I could see the map and I could even hear the lady giving me directions. Do you know they took me to the wrong place? I'm not going to go any further with that. I'll let you draw the inference. But there are some times we put our faith in the wrong thing, don't we? There are times where we look for direction and we look for it in the wrong places. What did I have to do? <laughs> First of all, I turned my phone off. <laughs> and then I kind of gasped. And then I said, oh, I recognize this place, this place. Ten minutes later, oh, here it is. And boy, was I a long way off. What did I have to do, though? There had to be a change of direction in order to get to the place where I needed to be. Repentance is a change of attitude that brings about a change of practice. It is all about God's forgiveness. It's a new beginning. Because for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. 
We need repentance. And the message of John the Baptist is this, repent. Repent. The Jews were getting quite an education on what that would mean. Verses 5 through 8 tell us that uh, John, John's message was quite an attraction. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sin. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. Okay, so if you see me doing that today, that would be considered very unusual, wouldn't it? Trust me, that would be very unusual. I've eaten a lot of things. However, sometimes you've got to draw a line, right? That would be very unusual. Uh, the people, they weren't so focused on what John the Baptist was wearing... They weren't so focused on his diet. They were focused on his message. They were focused on what he had to say. I don't think they came to hear him because John was a great speaker. I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know if they came to hear him because of his eloquence. I think they came to hear him, and I think the people flocked to the message that John the Baptist had just because of the hope that was in the message. Why do people come today? Can I say this? It's all about hope, isn't it? It's all about finding hope in a hopeless world, maybe in a hopeless situation. There was an attraction to John's message. They would walk, some of them, 20 to 30 miles to hear this guy. He looked funny. He ate funny, but he had a great message. And it was this very message that drew them. This message can be seen in four different elements. Uh, a realization of our own sinfulness. You know what? No matter how much we try to deny the reality of sin, uh, we sin every day. We are all sinners here. I spoke with a gentleman yesterday who came into my office and, and he said, you know what, uh, I'm not as bad a sinner as some other people. You know what I did? I looked at him, I said, praise God for that. I think that's fantastic. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah, well, you're a sinner. And sin is sin. See, it's a reality, a realization that we are sinful. Secondly, uh, sin in turn always produces guilt. We feel guilty before others. Most importantly, we feel guilty before God. And uh, guilt drives us to do some very different things, doesn't it? For some people, they will go to find the relief of their guilt in other avenues and in other things. For some, it will cause physical problems. It will cause emotional issues. Here's what Scripture says. I have sinned. And the response that God gives is this, I forgive. And we have that freedom. You know what? Guilt is also always accompanied by fear. Man is full of guilt, is filled with fear as he faces the future that he has. You see, we desire to be free, don't we? And you know what? The guilt, the shame, and the fear that come as a result of sin shackle us. And we find ourselves living in fear. John's message drew them because he spoke of the need of sin. He spoke of the need of forgiveness and repentance. 
The fourth aspect of, this, of uh, all of this comes in the fact that Jesus is the answer to man's sin problem. Are you ready for this? Uh, watch this. Hi, my name is Tim. I have a sin problem. Praise God, he is the answer. Insert your name there. Okay? Notice I didn't say insert your neighbor's name there. Insert your name there. Jesus is the answer to man's sin problem. John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We have the witness of John the Baptist. In verses 9 through 11, we see that the ministry of Jesus Christ is affirmed by God himself. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. A voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, lived in relative obscurity as a carpenter. He begins his ministry at 30. He comes to John to be baptized. His baptism was not for repentance because he didn't have any sin. His baptism was for consecration. He is showing that he is set apart for use by the will of the Father. And so Jesus is giving us this picture. And in these verses, we see that there is a special relationship with the Father. It says that you are my son. You are my son. He gives assurance to Jesus Christ and to those who are there. I claim you. You belong to me. You are mine. Don't ever forget that. It says here also that he was loved by him. You are my son whom I love. It speaks of the great sacrifice that was made that we see in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It also says this, with you, <laughs> with you I am well pleased. I am well pleased. The Father's affirmation of Jesus reveals how essential Jesus is to the Father's heart and to his plan. You know what? You cannot say that you love God, but you want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. We can't say that. That is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that Jesus, fully God, fully man, Isaiah 7, we talked about that last week, he was pleased by what he had seen. Thirdly, we see that, you know what, Satan uh, is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, right? It says that in 1 Peter. Um, also, we know that Satan worked very actively, actually, to try to defeat Jesus. And actually, with his own arguments, what happened? <laughs> we know that at the end of this account, Jesus says, be gone with you. Don't you just love that? We can do that. Satan, out of here. Be God. Jesus was able to do exactly that. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 12, 13. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days. What was happening there? Uh, he was being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. We just get bare glimpses 
of the temptation of Jesus here in this scripture. If you look in Matthew chapter 4, we see the wilderness temptations. Satan tried everything in his arsenal to defeat Jesus Christ here in the wilderness. The first temptation talks about being dissatisfied with God's provision. Satan questions the son's relationship with the father. If you are the son of God, he says. It's a conditional phrase. Uh, in the Greek, it's not a question, but it's an affirmation. Literally, what he is saying is, since you are, or because you are the Son of God, see, this is how Satan is, is addressing him. Satan isn't questioning the deity of Jesus. What he's, uh, in essence, doing is saying, okay, you say that you're the Son of God, prove it. Prove it. Show me. Okay. Is there any law against turning stones into bread? Is there anything saying we can't do that? Well, I can't. He certainly could. We know that. Nothing wrong with that. Except for the fact this was not the will of the Father. This is not what God the Father wanted for his son, he certainly had the power to do so. He could certainly meet a legitimate need. But to use his power in that way at this time would have shown a lack of faith in the father. You see, uh, Satan was telling him that God the father would not provide for him. The devil wanted Jesus to do his own thing. What did Jesus say? <laughs> Man shall not live by what? Bread alone. But, sometimes we stop right there, but by every word that proceeds out of the very mouth of God. Be dissatisfied with God's provision. The second temptation demanded proof of God's love. You will remember uh, Satan takes him to the highest pinnacle. It's approximately, they say, a 450-foot drop. Okay, uh, how many of y'all are scared of heights? Okay, I'm not scared of heights. I'm not a fan of falling. I'm not, I'm not afraid of heights necessarily. Okay, 450 feet high, that's quite a spell. And Satan has him there. And Satan starts quoting scripture. Satan uses it in all the wrong way. Jump off, and you won't be hurt. Go ahead. You can do this. Having seen Jesus defeat him already by quoting Scripture, Satan quotes it himself, uh, but of course he misquotes it. It was right as far as it went, but he did not quote it all. You shall give your angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. You kind of missed that one a little bit. God's promise to protect the Messiah as he carried out his Father's will. Was this the Father's will, that he would listen to Satan and do exactly that? No. And Jesus recognized that for what it was. You know what? I got to imagine, if people had seen Jesus do that, uh, you know what? The, that might make Fox News. That might make CNN. Uh, insert uh, whatever publication you want. Somebody falls 450 feet and they're not hurt and they get up walking around, they have a smile on their face, people are going to be talking. Jesus would have been famous at that point, wouldn't he? But Jesus understood to start his ministry from jumping from the pinnacle of the temple would be completely contrary to the will of God. Let me say this, Jesus refused to take a shortcut. He refused to do that. The third temptation, don't wait on God's plan. Here Satan, the God of the world, offers Jesus everything that he could see. In effect, Satan was offering Jesus a kingdom 
without the cross? Why go through all of the trouble and pain to win the world when I can give it to you right now? You don't have to go through any of this. It was a real temptation. A political solution, wasn't it? But Satan dismissed him with these words, away with you. So what does this all have to do about Christmas? You've probably been sitting there going, I don't get this guy. Well, this is the season that we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ in human form, a baby in Bethlehem. John wanted us to know that Jesus did not begin to exist at that time. He always has, co-eternal with the Father. Matthew wanted us to know that Jesus had the legal right to be the Messiah. He was of the house and lineage of David. Mark shows us how Jesus was announced by John the Baptist affirmed by God the Father, and even proven by the opposition of Satan to be the very Savior of the world. Probably the most simple truth, and as I was sitting at my desk uh, earlier this week and looking at all of this, uh, I couldn't help but chuckle, because you know what? Uh, simple reasoning, Herbert, is the best reasoning. Remember when I said I need simple? Yeah. I need simple. And here is the simple truth this morning. I wrap this all up in this series on Christmas this morning. We're going to have, we're going to have one more message out of uh, Luke. But I wrap this up this morning. That the Christ that John spoke of, that he prepared the way for, the affirmation of Father God, at his baptism and subsequent ministry. The opposi opposition that Satan tried to bring his way could not have possibly happened if this had not happened. It's very true. And you know what, you might think, yeah, you might think, boy, uh, that is so simple, duh. Can I confess to you, I said the same thing at my desk? Duh. But then you stop. Once you're done saying duh, and Pastor Tim is off his rocker, and I'm okay with that, by the way. Once you stop saying duh, and you look at the deep, deep ramifications of these credentials, we see that the baby who came, the Christ child who came, in a manger, is the very same Christ who died on a cross for you and for me. He didn't have to, did he? But yet he did it because of the deep and abiding love that he has for you and for me. Can I say, uh, for those of you that present a gifts at Christmas, this is an example of the finest gift that you will ever, ever have. That you will ever, ever possess. There's a commercial on TV, and I think it's for a fitness, uh, some type of inversion tape. I don't know. I don't know all this fitness stuff. Uh, but the guy says, uh, you know what, this, this thing, whatever it is, he, he says, uh, this is my most prized possession. It really is. He smiles and nods his head so that you'll do the same and break out your credit card, right? Uh, that, that's why they do that. He says, it's my prized possession. I can't live without it. It really is. Can I say, the most prized possession that we have is the forgiveness of sin that we have because of what Christ has done for you and for me. Okay? Don't put your faith in stuff. <laughs> Don't put your faith in infomercials. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we thank you. Lord, some of the most simple and basic of truths, Lord, we need to spend more time on. 
Lord, we, we look at the life of Christ and just these snapshots here out of the book of Mark. Father, it all began there in verse 1, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of eternity with you. Father, we thank you for your unspeakable gift, the gift of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen.